My name is Tom Shakespeare and I'm a fellow of the British Academy, the UK national body for the humanities and social sciences. Today I'm going to share findings of my research with disabled people in Africa in just 10 minutes. Disabled Africans face structural barriers in environment, in education, in employment, and they're faced with discrimination that limit their chances of achieving success on an equal basis with others. All the indicators are bad. Yet, at the same time, anyone who spends time with disabled Africans has encountered dozens of successful, assertive, proud disabled people. And often uh, these folk are associated with vibrant disabled people's organisations, but increasingly they've moved into mainstream roles in society. I think we researchers have to capture the agency of disabled people while balancing that with an awareness of those structural forces that make it so difficult for disabled people and their households to survive, let alone thrive. As part of a research project funded by ESRC and the Department for International Development, led by Nora Gross, who's a professor at UCL, I wanted to find and talk to African people with disability who overcome barriers and find out how they'd done it. So I partnered with uh, researchers like uh, Joseph Simbaya, uh, Anthony McGarry, Emily Nairiki, and their colleagues in Zambia, Uganda and Kenya and local disabled people's organisations and NGOs in order to recruit people. So we did in-depth qualitative interviews, life history interviews if you like, uh, because we wanted to hear the voices of disabled people. And we had no problem uh, recruiting people, folk were there. And our 105 people included people with hearing loss, with sight loss, uh, people who'd survived polio, people like me who had restricted growth, uh, some folk who were albino, and many with other physical impairments. And 39 of our respondents uh, were women. About a fifth of our people hadn't finished school. Uh, that's not surprising. We know from other data that approximately one third of out of school children in low and middle income countries have disabilities. But I was surprised that a lot of our participants had degrees and even postgraduate degrees. So why was that? Well, some people had found benefactors, uh, individuals or um, development organisations, to pay their school and college fees. But completing education was tough. As we were told by a Kenyan woman with a mobility impairment, she'd been unable to attend the school because it was three kilometres away, and obviously people walked to and fro school, until her grandfather made her walking sticks. And so from the age of 10, she could manage that journey. Other children with disabilities were mocked or even bullied in school, um, not just by other pupils, sometimes by teachers as well. And if you were to endure that, family support was crucial. Uh, for example, a, a guy from Uganda, who'd survived polio in infancy, uh, was the first in his family to get a degree. That's something we heard a lot about. And he spoke warmly of his own father's commitment to his education. If you don't go to school and study, you definitely know you will not manage in this environment, said his dad. And this participant subsequently sponsored the education of four of his siblings. And this was very common. We heard lots of people say that they were the first to finish school in their family and that they were now fulfilling their family responsibilities, such as supporting their brothers and sisters, maybe their nephews and nieces, unrelated children through education, or they were looking after their elderly parents. And remember, this is a context with almost no um, uh, social support uh, from the government. And when they faced barriers, our participant used ingenuity to overcome them. For example, another Kenyan woman uh, described how she'd attended mainstream school. And I said, but you were deaf. Did you have a sign language interpreter? And she said, no. And I said, but it must have been a big class. And she said, yeah, 70 children. Um, and what she did 
because she couldn't hear a word that the teacher said, she found the cleverest pupil in the class and copied his or her notes. And if she didn't understand his or her notes, she found the next cleverest, copied them. And in an African education system, a lot of it is by rote learning. So she less learned the lessons, worked hard, memorized the notes, passed her O-levels, passed her A-levels, teacher training. And then when she went to university to get an education degree, that's when she learned sign language opened a different world to her. Um, and she wasn't privileged, this woman. She, her parents were uneducated agricultural workers. They didn't even own their own land. And neighbours had told her father uh, that uh, she would never amount to anything. Her deafness was the result of witchcraft. Um, so she wanted to prove them wrong. She was the only member of her family to finish school, let alone go to university. And now, of course, she was supporting her brothers and sisters. Education is very highly valued in Africa because, of course, it improves your chances of getting good job or livelihood afterwards. Um, and our participants, we looked for people who'd had economic success. So it's not surprising that we found lots of good jobs. What had they done? Um, 16 out of our 105 were civil servants at various levels, including right to the top level. Uh, 12 were teachers or lawyers. Um, and of the rest, uh, 22 worked in voluntary organizations or disabled people's organizations. 18 were traders or shopkeepers or were artisans like tailors or cobblers or knitters. Uh, nine worked in business. Eight uh, were farmers. I remember buying some of the nicest peanut butter I have ever tasted from one participant in Uganda. I want to go back for more of that. A Zambian guy who'd experienced spinal cord injury while he was at college told me how he bounced back, saying, OK, this is just a disability. I can still use my hands, still use my brains. Let me see what I can do. And he had a shop. He employed several people. Guess what? He was educating, sponsoring the education of, a, uh, I think, a niece and one other unrelated child. What he wanted was a wife. Uh, because life is more than a job. Um, and so I want to tell you that 71 of our 105 respondents were married, or sometimes they had been married but were now widowed. And between them, they had, they had a lot of children. And many of these uh, adults that we talked to were active in their church or mosque because faith was very important to them. The, um, uh, the, the, the blind guy and his mum said, you of all my children must finish school. Uh, and he was a Muslim. He had two wives. I think he had 12 children, very active in his mosque. The tailor in Lusaka, who explained, I said to him, what is the secret of your success? And without a, without a beat, he replied to me, the grace of God. Maybe, but more directly, this man also had his sister to thank because she had bought him a sewing machine and his brother-in-law had f paid for his tailoring classes. And now married, three children, he, he, was, he was doing her work okay. So God worked maybe through his family. Uh, if we want to, uh, to to go with that explanation. Uh, and all of this tells me something about their levers of success that enable people with disabilities to succeed against what are often very severe odds. Uh, family, very important. Those supportive mothers or fathers or siblings or grandmothers or aunts. Um, the, the guy who told us that his brothers had carried him, he was a polio survivor, five kilometres to school every day. And then when he was at school, they carried him between classes and to the toilet when he needed to go. That's family love. That enabled him to succeed. Now, my respondents were a bright bunch. Uh, they were very, very clever. I, did, I didn't do anything to tell them it was testing or whatever, but you, know, you could tell they were very bright. Um, they showed great resilience, uh, mental strength. They didn't give in to self-pity. Uh, as one man said, if I start pitying myself, I will fail. And no one is caring about me and no one is willing to help me. So I have to cope with whatever comes ahead of me. Um, so they sought out skills training or their parents found skills training so that they could become craftspeople um, uh, or to learn how to look after uh, bees or pigs or chickens. Um, one of our respondents uh, became a photographer, went for training to become a photographer 
it gave him a trade he could sell and earn. And of course, in some cases, as I've said, these admirable personal qualities meant that they attracted the attention of sponsors or donors, either from their own communities or sometimes for a, from a high income country. Because, of course, if you're a bright kid with disability and you're lucky, people will say, oh, they deserve to be supported. We're going to help them get over those barriers. Um, I mean, if you're in Uganda, there, um, many of our disabled respondents had government uh, scholarships to attend university because they were disabled students. Um, and of course, once you uh, got those qualifications, you might end up as a teacher, that's a good job, um, or perhaps working in a disabled person's organisation. Now, I'm not saying that these folks are necessarily representative. Most people with disabilities in Africa, I'm afraid, are still defeated by barriers, uh, still sometimes begging for something to eat and struggling to survive. Um, and this story of, of prejudice, many of our people had experienced prejudice, maybe from a family member like a grandmother, maybe from a mother-in-law, you know, you're not going to marry my child, or others in their own families, or people they work with. Often they had chosen to work in disabled people's organisations because they were free of prejudice, which had held them back in the mainstream. But the evidence overall of these 105 people is that many folk with disabilities do succeed in overcoming barriers. And in development terms, they're a good investment. You're not wasting your money with this bunch. They give back to their families, to these children that they educate, and to their communities. Often they become role models, working uh, through disabled people's organisations to show others a way forward. And I think that the success of the people I spoke to shows that more disabled people can succeed if they get the chance. If we can work together to remove barriers and provide better services, the stories I've told you today will be more common. Even telling these stories helps others, I hope, uh, be inspired. The COVID-19 epidemic is going to hit this continent very hard. Think about it. If you're a day labourer, you need the money that day. You can't self-isolate. Um, you know, there, there, there are 10 ventilators for the whole of Burkina Faso, there are 20 million people. It's a different situation. There is no protective PPE for carers uh, in these sorts of settings. So I hope that when the rebuilding comes, they're not forgotten. Uh, in Kenya, I met a very senior civil servant. Uh, she'd been born with uh, a malformed arms, like a thalidomide survivor, uh, and she'd had a great career. She'd really done well. And what she said to me, I want you to remember, you do what you can, at least to change the mind of these negative ones. And there are also positive ones who come to embrace you. Thank you for listening.